Okay, get it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our second session of the afternoon. My name is Kathleen Edwards, and I am the Education Manager for Family Councils Ontario. My pronouns are she and her. And before we get started with the next session, I want to take a moment to send uh, and just to recognize and thank the individuals who are part of the Family Councils Ontario Conference Planning Committee. So I want to thank Pauline Schneider, Michelle Fleming, Linda Strom, Peter Munovich, Julian Morelli, Adam Pierre, Tiffany Fearon, and Samantha Peck who are all part of the conference planning committee and who helps to uh, organize the amazing schedule of sessions that you're going to be enjoying over the next few days. So I'm excited to introduce Alison Kilborn from the Ontario Caregiver Organization and her session, How Family Councils Can Support Essential Care Partner Programs. And I'm going to share a little bit about who Alison is. Allison is the manager for the Essential Care Partner, Pro Partner Support Hub at the Ontario Caregiver Organization. Allison has over 10 years of leadership experience in home and community care and a history of working in the community health sector with seniors impacted by poverty. She is an ex she's experienced in the development, management, and evaluation of programs and services that support caregivers, as well as seniors living in the community. She is passionate about promoting health equity and collaboratively creating system-wide solutions to improve the lives of caregivers and those they care for. Most recently, she's worked alongside health systems partners to support caregiver inclusion and improve the caregiver experience across setting. So with further ado, I will introduce you to Alison Kilborn, who will be speaking for this afternoon's session. And when you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them during the Q&A part of this presentation. Take it away, Alison. Hi. Hi everyone, and thank you so much, Kathleen, for that very warm welcome. Uh, it's really lovely to be here today and uh, be with everyone. Thank you so much for having us, Family Council of Ontario. Uh, I'm absolutely loving the theme as well for, for the whole conference this week and I'm really excited um, to, to be part of it. So without further ado, I will um, share with you my presentation and we'll get going. Bear with me while I get it up on my screen and move all of my pieces so they're not in the way. Oh my goodness. There we go. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see, uh, can see it, it all makes sense. And uh, we'll, we'll get started. And again, thanks so much for, for having me today. Um, I wanna start off by just kind of providing an overview of what I will be talking about today. Hi, so I'm gonna- yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but we can see your presenter notes. There we go, I knew it. Sorry, I, I, this is great, I apologize. No worries. Okay, we're gonna do it again. Try again here, folks. Here we go. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna try it again. Nash, tell me now. Can you see my presenter view now? You see your notes, yeah. Never mind, we won't do those then. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you for bearing with me. Um, so I'm here today to talk about how family councils can support an essential care partner program in your long-term care home. Uh, here's an overview of what I will be talking about today. I'm going to start by really introducing uh, the Ontario Caregiver Organization. Some of you might not be familiar with us, and talk a little bit about how the Essential Care Partner Support Hub started uh, and how we came to be. 
And I'm going to really focus on, you know, really understanding and setting the context for um, how caregivers are absolutely critical to the health and well-being of residents in long-term care and then in the healthcare system overall. I'm going to also talk about, um, obviously, like what is an essential care partner program and in particular, how can it help to advance uh, person-centered care? And throughout the presentation, I'm going to highlight key resources and tools uh, you can use as a family council, long-term care homes can use, uh, others can use to either promote buy-in or uh, kind of uh, introduce the idea of an essential care partner program, implement a program, or improve one if you already have one in your long-term care home. So first off, uh, I just wanted to introduce you to the Ontario Caregiver Organization. We are a nonprofit organization, and really um, our sole purpose is to uh, improve the lives and support Ontario caregivers caring for uh, informal, those informal family caregivers having relationships with uh, families and supporting folks across Ontario, across a number of care settings, um, and with without um, kind of barriers towards any kind of disease diagnosis, um, setting, and really understanding that those caregiving relationships can look uh, and feel very different uh, across uh, the lifespan. We do this in a number of ways. Uh, at, at, at the Ontario Caregiver Organization, we provide caregiver and public information about, um, about the um, caregiving as a whole. We also provide direct caregiver programs and services, and I'll highlight a couple that we, um, that we have that might be uh, particularly relevant. Um, we provide caregiver insights and engagement. We have a wonderful caregiver advisory panel that we work with and really work alongside caregivers to not only infer, inform the development of our own tools and resources, but also to help provide um, insights to government and other key stakeholders, in particular in the health system. We also do a lot of public awareness to really ensure that everyone has an understanding of um, the caregiving role and what that means, uh, what that means for caregivers in Ontario. Finally, uh, we also do system outreach and collaboration, and this is um, really relates to the Essential Care Partner Support Hub, and that is where our work has primarily evolved from this existing space. Um, and that's the focus of my work today is really talking about in terms of the work that we've done in this area, how we can continue to support the inclusion of caregivers um, in long-term care home spaces. So the Essential Care Partner Support Hub is a new initiative at the Ontario Caregiver Organization. Um, this is a new initiative that we are doing in partnership with Ontario Health. And the Support Hub really allows us to provide support to Ontario hospitals and long-term care homes who are planning to implement or even enhance an Essential Care Partner program. Um, this uh, concept really is um, a longer term vision to support the adoption and implementation of essential care partner programs across multiple healthcare settings, but we have a, an initial focus in hospitals and long term care. As part of the support hub, we offer guidance and coaching to long term care homes leading practices based on organizations, including long-term care homes and hospitals that have successfully implemented. And I'll, and I'll be taking us through some of those leading practices today. We also have resources, tools, and templates, connections to settings and peers that have been implemented, um, and opportunities for learning and ongoing knowledge exchange. The knowledge exchange in particular is really um, where our work um, started and, it, and where the Essential Care Partner Support Hub has evolved from. Um, now I'm gonna kind of, um, before I move forward, I will do a little 
bit of a poll to see um, where folks are at and really get an understanding of um, the, the folks here today, your knowledge of essential care partner programs, if you know about them or if you don't, if your home has one in place or if you did. Uh, I'm just curious to know um, how that's sitting with folks today uh, before we get started. So if we could launch that poll, um, and if hopefully that works, uh, please take a minute to um, to answer uh, to answer the polls, and we will um, get a sense before we move on what uh, what folks are thinking. So we'll just take a few minutes here as we answer. You can just um, click on whichever button makes sense for you, um, and this gives me a really good sense of. Uh, where things are at uh, in the in the audience today. So keep keep answering that poll if you if you can, um, and we'll give it another minute or so. Very excited about the results here, and uh, I think there'll be a lot of. Ooh, we have one at our program. I'm here at our long term care home. I'm really excited to share the results, and we'll close the poll shortly. Let's give it a one more minute before folks are uh, closing the pool. Okay, I think that um, most folks have uh, responded by now. And so I'm going to, I think, um, we want to, uh, oh, I'm already seeing a great question, so I'll make sure I answer that uh, in my presentation, and I think it will become very clear. Um, but let's end the poll, and I will share the results with everyone. So you can kind of see here, we have um, two folks where we have an actual essential care program program at their long-term care home. I'm very excited to hear from those folks in the chat and get your perspective on things. A couple who maybe have heard of this concept but would like to learn more, and and then a large number of folks who have probably no idea what I'm talking about, but hopefully will by the end. Um, and so please feel free to, you know, pop questions into the chat. Make sure that, um, uh, you know, make sure that you kind of walk away from today with a very good idea of uh, what we're talking about. So in answer to the very kind of first question asked, do, are you familiar with or do you know what an essential care partner program is? So what is an essential care partner program? An essential care partner program is really a set of policies and practices implemented in a care setting that identify, include, and support caregivers as essential partners on the care team. Now, you know, this framework that we've kind of identified with these three key pieces has a whole number of associated practices, policies, and, um, you know, program elements under each one. But at the end of the day, an essential care partner program really wraps up all of these different pieces to um, create a formal program that acknowledges and recognizes the role of caregivers and in particular family, um, chosen family uh, by and in the care team alongside. And, you know, we've seen the, the evolution and the development of essential care partner programs across a number of settings. And I'm going to explain in much more detail throughout the presentation um, what this looks like. And I also have a great video to share that also really encapsulates it. Um, so I'm not going to answer that first question right now that popped through the chat in terms of what's the difference between, um, you know, an essential care partner program and a family council. I think it will become really clear. But let's remember, if I haven't answered that question by the end, um, I'll, I'll cycle back to that. So. Before I move forward in terms of really the kind of nuts and bolts of what an essential care partner program is, I wanted to take us back and provide a little bit of context for um, the evolution not only of uh, essential care partner programs as they are right now in Ontario, but also the essential care partner support hub where, I, where my role is at the Ontario Caregiver Organization. 
And to do that, I want to just provide some context first. So, um, you know, I mentioned at, at the beginning that uh, the Ontario Caregiver Organization has all of those different kind of working elements. And a key piece is system, uh, system and health partner collaboration. Um, and part of that is really our, um, our, our, our need to work with health system partners to ensure that um, there is an understanding that caregivers are absolutely critical to our healthcare system. Um, as family council members, as caregivers yourselves, you are probably very much aware of this, but um, this is a really good reminder for many of our health system partners. There are over 4 million caregivers across Ontario. Uh, and when you kind of add it all together, really those caregivers are actually providing about 75% of the care in the system. Um, and so when we, uh, when we look at that, um, that kind of system of care and the amount of care that's provided, um, we look at it in what we call our partners in care equation. Um, this equation means that residents or patients or clients, depending on the setting you're in, plus caregivers and care providers, team members, staff, all of those make up uh, folks uh, that are important to include in that partners in care approach. So that's kind of the, the backdrop and the context that, that we're working in. Now, this became really challenging in the pandemic. Um, and I, you know, I don't wanna kind of spend too much time here, but it is important in terms of thinking about it from an origin story perspective uh, or a little bit of context for, you know, how we got to today and how we, we formed the Essential Care Partner Support Hub. So as many of you are probably very, very familiar with, um, at, the, at the beginning of the pandemic, visitor restrictions were put in place. Um, uh, any access restrictions in general uh, were put in place uh, in order to protect and to protect the safety of uh, patients, residents throughout the healthcare system. Um, you know, very shortly after the first wave, um, there was a deep, uh, uh, and it got to be a deeper understanding that this had a profound impact, not only on um, the families who weren't able to see uh, their care recipients, but on patients, on residents, on folks who, who were not able to have their family by their side. This uh, bar graph is a clip from uh, one of the reports released by the patient ombudsman, which captured, uh, you know, the, the number of complaints. And the top complaints, of course, in long-term care homes during that time was related not only to infection prevention, but the visitation was, was up there, as well as communication and, and, other, and other issues that, um, that have been longstanding issues. So um, this really kind of takes us back to... Um, to kind of the start of the pandemic. And in fact, when, um, when that started, the Ontario Caregiver Organization, in partnership with the Change Foundation, began a learning collaborative. And that learning collaborative um, was an interactive forum where all um, health settings could come together. In particular, hospitals and long-term care homes could learn from each other and really uh, try and come up with creative ways to enable the safe presence of um, caregivers and family members, even with uh, outbreaks or visitor restrictions in place. Um, and so that's kind of the, a little bit of the origin story. And as we, as I'll kind of explain um, how essential care partner programs evolved from that, um, I think that that will help. But before I go there, one of the kind of key learnings, uh, certainly from the pandemic, was a very real understanding that if caregivers are not included as essential care partners, there's risk and harm to residents. And that risk and harm to residents also means that there's risk uh, to, the, to the healthcare system overall. There was um, some amazing research done that really demonstrated the, the result on the health and well-being of residents, but also the impact on team members as well. Um, you know, I still anecdotally speak to, to many folks uh, working in long-term care 
who uh, experienced severe moral distress having to enact policies that they knew were not person-centered and um, really struggled and the amount of moral distress experienced um, was profound. Uh, in addition, you know, um, and I think as, as one colleague in long-term care remarked, um, I don't know that there was a real appreciation of how much heavy lifting families were doing um, in long term care uh, prior to the pandemic and certainly um, uh, the pandemic created this kind of vacuum effect where all of a sudden it became very clear um, the role not only for emotional support and well-being, but even uh, physical tasks that, that family members were playing in long term care. Um, you know, the flip side of this is that uh, we now have a much better understanding of the benefits of including uh, family, including those essential care partners. There's a lot great evidence related to, you know, the improved quality of care that's provided, improved patient and resident outcomes, improved health quality indicators definitely improved working conditions for healthcare teams, and that means less pressure overall in the healthcare system. Um, this is particularly important for vulnerable groups um, and equity uh, deserving groups. So when you think about folks who might've had language barriers or might have unique sociocultural needs, um, these kind of impacts are tenfold. I want to focus on and provide a little bit of a spotlight on some terrific research that was done from the Breer Research Institute, um, as well as Ontario uh, Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation in Long-Term Care. Um, they did fantastic work related to essential care partner programs, and that research really enabled the creation of some amazing tools that I'll, I'll um, introduce during today's session as well. So um, this research project focused on three Ontario long-term care homes who actually um, implemented essential care partner programs during the pandemic. They did many interviews, surveys with residents, family members, as well as staff. And this was also um, done in parallel with a larger provincial survey conducted of family members across Ontario um, that was also completed that helped inform uh, some comparisons to what other long-term care homes were dealing with. And again, this is in around 2021, so this is still at the height of the pandemic. So some of the key research findings that I wanted to highlight here was that essential care partners are essential. And in a second, I'll share a video that really highlights that uh, amazingly well. And uh, notably, uh, you know, when essential care partners were not involved, residents' health and well-being declined. Um, and was very clear that essential care partners helped with many aspects of daily life, but that emotional support, that social connection and emotional support was incredibly important. There were also some really unique learnings um, that demonstrated that um, there was really a need for improved relationships between family and team members in long-term care. Um, and also that essential care partners played two distinct but equally important roles. One of, uh, you know, care partner and actually helping with the emotional support um, and physical tasks in some cases, but also one of advocate really being able to speak up on behalf of the resident. Um, and I think that that's something where there sometimes is a bit of that um, you can see uh, the parallels with family councils where um, there's advocating for the needs of your, your own uh, care recipient resident and then thinking about the broader impact on the home itself. Um, so I want to share this video now and I'll, we're going to all cross our fingers that I can pull this off technology wise. So I'm going to sh cross, uh, share my, my screen now and we'll make sure that this works. It's about a 10 minute video and it, it's a really great demonstration of um, not only the research, but what essential care partner programs look like and what they will look like in the future. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and reshare 
um, because I want to make sure that I'm sharing my audio and that that's going to work perfectly. So bear with me here. Here we go. Family presence in long-term care has really gone for decades as an unacknowledged contribution to people that are living in long-term care. People move in and they become a resident and they still depend on and look forward to and rely on the people in their lives from before they lived in long-term care. And it was really during the pandemic that there became formal acknowledgement of the contribution of family members and friends and, and just how important those people are to the people who live in long-term care. In March of 2020, life did change. And the fear of COVID caused people to tighten up and cause restrictions and prevent families from coming in. And that came from a good place to protect loved ones, but it did not take long to see that we were going about this the wrong way and something had to change. So designated care partners or DCPs, as we call them here at Briere, are also called essential care partners, ECPs and other organizations. And what they are, uh, family members, friends, anyone the resident feels comfortable to have come in and be part of their care team to provide different aspects of their care. The difference between a visitor and a DCP or essential care partner role comes down to many things, one being training. So they're learning about the rules, learning how to do things safely. It gives them a sense of responsibility, they have a sense of accountability, and they're members of the team. They are a valuable member of the team that by becoming a DCP or a designated care partner, you end up being not just a visitor. It doesn't mean that you have to come in and dress and bathe and all those cares, but your level of comfort and where you would like to have your visit begin and end, we can do that with the DCP program. Essential care partners are essential because they are the connection between the resident and the support team that's here. It's an advocate, it's a loved one, it's someone who knows the resident best. It's important to make the DCPs really feel part of the team because one, it all comes down to the resident and they are the best advocate for the resident. There's also the fact that they become comfortable to know to whom they can talk to when the residents need something. That familiarity, those connections helps them to be better advocates for the resident. You always see the joy in their face for them to actually be granted that access. For example, the couples that are, you know, have been together the longest, they haven't been away from their loved one for the last 40 years they've been together. Navigating all that stuff, even when it's very onerous, they have to get tested to come into the residence, but they understand that it all comes down to, to protecting their loved one, but also to guaranteeing that continued connection with their loved ones. I believe firmly that the DCP program uh, has, has really reduced the isolation effects that residents have experienced. When you have a DCP bring their family out to a program that we're running, it totally enhances the experience of that resident because they've been able to get them out of their rooms and get them involved in programs and getting outside and it just excites them to come out and be involved. And we like to see that. I think you also had to be very aware of the emotional side of some of our DCPs were spouses who were alone. It was extremely important for many of our spouses that this visiting was as important for them as it was for our residents as well. Before the pandemic, there was certainly anecdotal evidence and there was some scientific evidence that the role played by family members and close friends for residents in long-term care was important. But it had not been a major focus of research at that point. Ontario Centres for Learning, Research and Innovation in Long-Term Care introduced us to early adopters of an intervention that was intended to allow family members and essential care partners into the homes during times of outbreak. There are a number of key findings from our research. The first is the very simple but important finding that essential care partners are essential. When essential care partners are barred from the home, there are declines in well-being. When they're allowed back in, things improve. The most dramatic example of this that we found had to do with people living with dementia, people living with Alzheimer's in long-term care homes. I don't think any of us knew the extent of the importance until the pandemic. 
for someone who had Alzheimer's disease or anyone with dementia, he's already isolated, isn't he, in his own little cocoon. He couldn't do puzzles or games, wouldn't be interested at all in FaceTime or things like that until that magic moment when we could get together because of the DCP program. And that was all the difference in the world because I could rub his shoulder and touch his arm. You could just see his whole body relax and know that I'm right there and my voice was there. It's just the magic of, of connection and it was pure joy. Anyone taking on a designated care role should certainly be prepared to make a real commitment to it. It's important to want to be in and to come regularly and to keep the connection going. It's also important to know how much you'll receive yourself from the experience of continuing your memories and you'll be surprised how much you get back yourself, not only with the resident that you care so much about when you're visiting, but others who are there too, if you're able to just let them know that you see them and you're interested in their welfare. It's a very important role. It has, I think, life-changing significance for long-term care. Care falls into a couple of different categories. The basic category is what some people refer to as psychosocial care. It's not transactional care where you deliver a care bundle like a set of medication. It's relational that occurs through the unfolding of the relationship, the interaction, and that is the kind of care that people exhibit toward each other when they simply spend time together. But we also learned that a great many essential care partners go beyond this, not all do, and provide some elements of things like personal grooming. Being with a person at mealtime, taking them into maybe a garden-like setting, it's all of these things that reminds them of pleasant times during their life. The family is involved in a lot of the activities that we do, and they can help if they wish uh, in exercising and things like that. And it's so much easier. It really is. It lifts the morale of the residents and the staff and myself. Just being there is pretty much as important as anything. You look forward to your, your days with them. It's a benefit all around. The more company and the more convenient it is to come in through the DCP program, the better it'll be for whoever your loved one is that's in the home as a resident. Once in a lifetime moments won't be lost the way they have been for many people. One of the hardest things with the pandemic and restricting people was restricting people at a time as sacred as end of life, the time that they deserve to have with their loved one. Thankfully, I witnessed a resident's 100th birthday, and without the DCP program, she would not have been able to celebrate with her family members. If there was anything I wanted anyone to know about the DCP program is that it is a win-win. Um, the, the time given to the training is going to be given right back in that time spent with loved ones. For anyone who is reluctant to consider being a DCP, with the training and support from the team, they will learn very quickly that they are part of the team. And that is essentially what it's about. That they're not working alone, that, that they're, they're not there to replace staff, they're working with the staff to provide the best care possible for their loved one. This role of essential care partner needs to have some formality about it. It needs to be seen as a role within the long-term care setting, just as the personal support worker has a role or the registered nurse has a role. This is a role that goes above and beyond that of a visitor to someone in the long-term care. Our designated care partner program, which was born out of an answer to restrictive visiting, has really become that formal acknowledgement and I see an opportunity for us to take that into the future so that it isn't just about how do we have people safely visiting during an outbreak but how do we have residents, family members and friends as part of the care team for the time that they live in long-term care essential caregivers or designated care partners and there's different names but it's all this formal acknowledgement of someone that the resident designates from outside the community as part of their care team. Care partners, residents, team members which is our words for staff, they all play a role in developing our programs and our policies and we're always looking at opportunities to include the DCPs in the day-to-day -day care 
and planning for the experience of people who live here. And that program and opportunity needs to be discussed from the moment someone moves in or is, is looking at moving in. I love how engaged family members and friends are in our care communities and how that has created truly a community in each of our long-term care homes. Family presence and friend presence in the home makes a place a community and a home, not just a long-term care facility. It's a place where people live, it's a place to find joy, it's a place that uh, we want to give people a life worth living. So uh, thank you so much for watching that. I hopefully it actually worked and you were able to see most of that. I think that there may have been some technical difficulties, but hopefully we managed. I'm going to reshare my screen. I see um, see a great uh, question already um, from, from Robert around um, really highlighting the fact that uh, you know, everyone does need a, 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 an essential care partner or a designated care partner. Um, so thinking about uh, already, what about residents uh, who don't have someone? And, and we can talk a little bit more about that, what that looks like um, in, in a second. Um, so I'm just going to reshare my screen and we will, um, and I'm just going to take us to the next uh, point with our presentation here. So, um, oh, I don't want to be on that slide. I want to be down here for a moment. So, um, oh, just wants to take me through the whole thing. Um, so, all right. Um, you know, what I think that the video really demonstrated was that, um, you know, essential care partner programs uh, are really um, about a kind of strategy to advance person-centered care. And I think that, you know, they end up being a kind of building block or um, strategy, you know, possibly can be used as a um, quality improvement initiative to think about, um, think about how this kind of program can be adopted by long-term care homes in order to uh, kind of move the needle on person-centered care and, and uh, use some formality and structure to, um, to, develop, uh, to develop an essential care partner program that would really help, uh, help residents and families be um, included and have that person-centered care perspective. So sorry, this diet, sorry, go forgive ahead. Me, yeah. Forgive me for interrupting. Uh, we've lost your video. If you, I can trouble you just to restart it. Yeah, sure. That's so weird. Okay. Thing, yeah. Let's see, I'm gonna stop. Oh, that's so weird. I wonder when that happened. All right, I'm happy to start again here. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. No, not not a problem at all. I probably pressed some button in <laughs> on the in in my in my sharing. Okay, so hopefully you can see me and um and and we're all good. And Dinesh, feel free to jump in and uh, jump in as needed. Yeah, maybe it's my screen, but I'm seeing some black boxes covering the screen share of the video. Have you closed the video itself, the other video? Yeah, sure. That's so weird. Yeah, it's really weird. I don't even know what other video it would be. I close all my windows. That works. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We are testing out Zoom events. No kidding. Um, very funny. Okay, one second. I've closed my presentation and now I'm going to reopen it again and fingers crossed that it'll work. Great. Otherwise, I'm happy to just chat with everyone. <laughs> and I love all the questions and I love all the questions so far. So hopefully uh, this is making sense for everybody. Okay. Thank you for being amazing, Madison. We appreciate yeah. it. Of course. Okay, let's try this again. Fingers crossed. What do you see? Uh, there's still something covering. It. I think it's from the video. Um, I'm not sure what's why it's blocking. It's so weird. I don't know. I don't know. So it, it it's blocking the actual screen. 
Mm -hmm. is, there, is, it, is it just me or is it, can others folks see that? Okay, so others can see it too, yeah. That's um, really strange. Okay. Okay. Gonna... We'll, we'll just continue on. I apologize for what's happening, but. That's very strange. <laughs> I love like the technology has, uh, how, how much is it blocking? Like, can you not see like the actual words on the slides? Uh, it's just the bottom right, but I think um, if you might have some windows open or little boxes, like. I don't yeah, have any other. Right. Weird. Yeah, I don't have any. I only now have PowerPoint open in my in our Zoom. And what about your screen share? Yeah, I am not sharing my screen currently, right? Right. What can you okay. check? Yes. Okay. Let's try this. That black box is still there. It's part of something. Um, really weird. Um, you click on Zoom, please. Yes, sure. Yes. Is this it? Is there anything on the right that you see? Like a box? No, I don't see anything on my screens. So strange. Okay, I'm just going to keep going at this point. I apologize to everyone. Uh, and thank you for bearing with us. I don't see anything else on my screen, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to just keep going. Being very strange. Okay. Every time it has to take me through this. Okay, so this kind of diagram, even if you can't see everything all together, uh, kind of takes us on a bit of a journey in terms of kind of person-centered care and how essential care partner programs fit in to the bigger picture. Um, so we see kind of for sure around growing evidence of the role of essential care partners, but then this moment in the pandemic and the video really depicted that well of really understanding the impact uh, of what happens when essential care partners, family, caregivers are not involved. Um, really now understanding around the supportive role of care partners um, and spreading and scaling leading practices related to essential care partner programs that we can kind of try and address the inclusion and the need for um, understanding um, uh, the important role of caregivers. Uh, and I would say that's kind of where we are now. Um, and that's really the role of the essential care partner support hub. And then finally thinking about um, the future stages in terms of how care partners can continue to be empowered and participate across all care settings. So um, I, this next kind of slide, if you can see it, um, kind of provides a snapshot from the national standards for long-term care. And I like this snapshot because if you notice in the middle of the red, the red circle has the resident there, but it also has essential care partners there, um, as well as substitute decision makers. And it distinguishes between both of those because an essential care partner does not necessarily have to be the substitute decision maker. They could be the substitute decision maker, but not necessarily. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a number of kind of key pieces here related to um, how essential care partner programs can um, align with the national standards, support compliance, obviously, with the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, but also do a lot of other kind of very tangible things uh, in long-term care, improving quality of life and well-being for residents, and then, of course, improving um, that um, relationship between resident and families, uh, and that, uh, as well as uh, care teams and enabling that kind of culture uh, of resident-centered uh, care. So um, I wanted to take a minute now and just do a bit of a, a deeper dive into what, do, what are the kind of elements of essential care partner programs and, and what do those uh, look like? Um, I'm not gonna go through the guiding principles um, one at a time, but I wanted to 
highlight two here. The first one is that recognizing that essential care partners are distinct from visitors and are really necessary to the safety, quality of care, and the health outcomes and well-being of patients and residents in particular in long-term care. Uh, so when we think about this, you know, visitors, of course, play an important social role, but recognizing that essential care partners are, in fact, distinct and different um, and that they play that critical role for the health and well-being of residents. And then finally, the last guiding principle I wanted to highlight here was the importance of meaningfully engaging care partners and patients or residents in the case of long-term care in the design and the development of policies and practices. Um, this is critical, and I think that this, this uh, guiding principle in particular is where family councils can play a huge role. So, um, I'll, and, I, and I will uh, kind of highlight a couple things at the end that I think that family councils can kind of walk away from today and think about uh, how to move this forward if you are interested. So I wanted to now move to thinking about um, leading practices that we've developed. So these leading practices are really a combination of what we've seen, what the collective work that we've seen from many early adopters, uh, including uh, those three long-term care homes uh, that um, exhibited in that um, video, uh, the research that was done through the um, Ontario CLRI, uh, as well as a kind of, uh, kind of environmental scan and overview of all the practices done related to essential care partner programs. And so what we've done is group them under their kind of three pillars. So identifying the caregiver, including the caregiver as part of the care team, and then supporting the care Caregiver. So I've highlighted a couple of examples here, but I'm actually going to kind of do a little bit of a walkthrough um, related to each leading practice. Uh, not each leading practice, but each kind of category, highlighting a couple. Um, and then I'll also highlight a number of resources or tools that might also be helpful to think about, to kind of connect the dots between um, what are the kind of resources and support that, that the Support Hub offers, um, because we want to make this as easy as possible for long-term care homes to implement or improve. So in terms of identifying the caregiver, um, this is really making sure that the um, resident themselves or their substitute decision maker has an opportunity to designate um, an essential care partner. So they need to, in order for that to happen, they need to be informed that there is, there, there is an essential care partner program. Um, this is a great opportunity for residents with a planned admission to identify their essential care partners in advance. Um, um, and really understanding um, that, that that's necessary for their involvement um, in the care team as they move forward. Um, one, of the, one of the tools that we've found really helpful is the use of a caregiver ID template. You probably saw some of those badges that were used in, um, in the video, and this is actually a badge that was adapted from materials originally created by the Change Foundation um, a number of years ago and that OCO has adopted and that we are spreading across Ontario. So this is a kind of badge or ID card, a template that we offer organizations um, that they can use to incorporate into a badge that identifies caregivers and really is that concrete way to recognize and facilitate their role uh, as partners on the care team. The other piece I wanted to highlight here is the point around inclusion. So really including the caregiver as part of the care team means that um, there's a number of pieces in place to enable that. So the first, as I would say, is around policies. So what are the policies that support um, presence and inclusion as part of the care team? How have staff been trained or educated in order to uh, make sure that they understand the value that caregivers bring to the table? Um, how have caregivers been integrated into, uh, into workflows within the home? Are caregivers um, included in care conferences, in family meetings? Are they prioritized? Are they able to speak? Are they on the agenda? Is their voice included? in those daily care team um, kind of uh, processes. So this is really about, you know, care team moments, um, inclusion and, and being listened to by, by staff. I, I remember 
um, uh, kind of a number of months ago, um, speaking with uh, some folks from long-term care, um, and it was uh, someone from a family council, and they mentioned that there had been so much staff turnover in their long-term care home that actually they were the, you know, as an essential care partner, they were the key link um, that were able to kind of provide not only staff with information about the resident themselves, but ensure that that staff knew what was happening. So they they ended up being the most consistent person rather rather than the staff. And I think that having um, a dedicated essential care partner program really recognizes that important role. Um, I wanted to highlight this terrific tool from Ontario CLRI. It's an infographic um, and it can be really helpful as a training tool for staff to really in kind of very plain language and with um, really lovely visuals um, show and demonstrate the importance of essential care partners in, in the role um, that they play with residents. Finally, support for the caregiver. Um, what we really find here is this means a number of things, but I want to highlight a couple here. It means that the care partner themselves is provided some kind of process for onboarding or orienting to them to the long-term care home. Um, you know, did um, you know, beyond just a tour of the home, um, how do they find out about important things that they need to know in order to really be involved in the care team? Um, and also, what kind of education or training are they provided, not only in terms of hands-on support, but also how are they linked to support for their own well-being? So are they provided with um, uh, kind of resources or supports that will really help them um, cope uh, in terms of their own caregiving role. Um, so I've highlighted here a couple of examples that long-term care homes could really think about easily kind of linking caregivers to support. And this can be regardless of which region or area you are across the province. So OCO provides, you know, a caregiver helpline, your support, a scale program, which is a um, an educational um, kind of uh, psychoeducational support program that, that it runs twice a year. Um, we also offer education videos, month um, really monthly webinars. We have toolkits, e-learning. Um, you know, one long-term care home that I was um, that I was speaking with uh, was thinking about offering a monthly their our monthly webinar uh, to um, in a in an open space and inviting family caregivers to attend. So things like that really help connect the dots between recognizing um, that those family members in long-term care also need support and that the long-term care home can be a real connector to that. So uh, what I thought is I kind of, uh, kind of wrap up um, and answer any other questions. I'm curious to know how our caregivers identified, included, and supported in your own long-term care home um, and would be more than happy to hear some thoughts in the, in the chat. And so keep those coming in and I'll wrap up and then we'll kind of move to the questions and make sure um, I've, I've added, I've answered everyone's question. I wanted to highlight a couple of resources that I think are particularly helpful and I'm happy to send any of these as follow up pieces or um, connect with you afterwards if, if you're interested in learning more. Um, so we have some great resources that are helpful to kind of gain the buy in from long term care home leadership. So we have a business case for uh, long term care homes for why they would want to adopt uh, an essential care partner program. We have terrific evidence summaries that summarize the benefits and risks for long-term care homes when essential care partners are not included and when they are included. Um, and CLRI, Ontario CLRI, out of that research project has developed an amazing implementation guide. So um, this, is, this is a guide that our team uh, uses with long-term care homes to help them in terms of uh, implementing uh, or improving an essential care partner program. It's rooted in evidence. It was co-designed with care partners, residents, and long-term care leaders. Um, and it's a terrific, terrific resource. 
one of the things I wanted to highlight is uh, from the resource is that um, one of the key steps that is identified within the resource is to engage with your resident and family council. So family councils are, you know, it really shouted out here and um, kind of made clear that that's a tool to to leverage in the development of an essential care program within long-term care. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here for family councils to, to be involved. Um, finally, I wanted to also um, invite you to find out more about our Essential Care Partner Learning Collaborative. Um, if you are interested in finding out more, please um, contact me and you can get involved and join the conversation and join other organizations as they implement and improve their programs. So I wanted to leave you with a couple of takeaways, um, thinking about essential care partner programs as a real strategy to build better relationships between team members and families, um, a strategy to advance person-centered care, um, and that family councils can play a kind of really critical role in terms of initiating or implementing or supporting the implementation or improvement of an essential care partner program. Um, uh, I would absolutely love to connect with any of you afterwards, um, so uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, please don't, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can uh, make sure that I can answer any chat questions that have come in, and I'm happy to, to hang on for a, a little bit afterwards as well and continue the dialogue. Thank you so much, Allison. I do see one final question, and it asks what role at the home typically has accountability for working with the family councils to start the uh, caregiver ID uh, program? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I think that that it's uh, it depends like there's no real, uh, you know, there's Certainly it's not legislated, right? There's no, no one's mandating a home to uh, have to work with a family council to start this type of program at this time. Um, but we are working really hard uh, to try and connect with long-term care homes across Ontario and really enable um, really in, um, kind of start the conversation. And I think that family councils have a really amazing opportunity to bring this, if, if it's an idea that, you know, the family councils uh, kind of into to bring it to the home and start that partnership conversation. That's certainly what I've seen happen in hospital settings. So we have a very active care partner in our learning collaborative. Um, he was part of his patient family council at his ho local hospital. He brought the idea to them and a year later they have a fully fledged essential care partner program. So um, I think that you know, with some strong voices and, and really understanding the value of this, this would be a really amazing project that, that a family council could work with in partnership with the leadership of a long-term care home to, to implement. Wonderful, yeah. So just talk to your administrator. If it's something you talk about as a council in a meeting that you would love to implement now that you've heard a little bit more about it, connect with Allison. Yes. Maybe have her come and speak to your council about yeah. the program so you can ask her specific question. And if you're having her come speak to your council, invite the home administrator, invite home staff to join you because then they're able to see it and it kind of starts the conversation that way. So that's probably a good step. If you're interested in this, reach out to Allison, you know, have her come and share a little bit to your council. So you're here, but maybe the other council aren't and they can learn a little bit more about what this program is and about what the OCO does. Uh, and start the ball, ball running that way. I will give a shout out to Sienna, um, who is a sponsor tomorrow for two of our sessions. Uh, they are starting a peer support program for families during the admission process. But during the admission process, because that's happening, it might lend itself quite naturally to a recognition of caregivers within their homes. So that might be a start if you're part of those homes with that program. And then I, I was telling Allison last week, I got to do my very first in-person presentation to a family council in a long-term care home. And as part of the sign-in process, it, there's this machine and it took a picture of my face and then printed it out on a sticker. And it had my role and reason for being there on the sticker that was my name tag. So that itself is kind of this yeah. program 
just it's formalized through the organization for anyone who is going in. And so, you know, it might be happening in your home. So celebrate that and acknowledge that and even just take the time to recognize the home for wanting to acknowledge your role as caregivers in the home and in the long-term care community. Thank you so much, Allison, for taking the time to speak today and sharing a little bit about what the Ontario Caregiver Organization does, as well as the Essential Caregiver Program. Um, I know it's something that gained a little bit of popularity during COVID, and I'm hoping it continues to grow across the long-term care sector because it is so, so needed and necessary. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, now we're going to give you a little bit of a break. What you can do is when you leave this session, you can, oh, what? that's mm -hmm. right. Yes, the family council could become the essential care partner for everyone who doesn't have one. Absolutely, Bob, because councils can talk to residents councils as we're gonna hear tomorrow and learn a little bit about resident needs are and especially if you review the resident council minutes and you notice that the home is not acknowledging a concern that's come up two or three or four times, the council can also add their voice to it. Um, so yeah, thank you. That's a great idea, Bob. Um, what criteria are used to validate an essential care partner? Frequency of visits, extent of care involvement. How is that measured? Have you considered identifying essential care partners that might be isolating those caregivers who don't meet the definition? That's a good question, Julia. That's a good question for Alice. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I guess maybe before we wrap up, I'll quickly answer that. Um, you know, certainly as part of our leading practices, we um, we don't, we, we almost actually don't define it. I think the only thing that we define it as is that it's someone your resident designates right, the resident or the substitute decision maker. So you don't have to reach some kind of test for, you know, number of visits, amount of involvement, that kind of thing, but really understanding that each uh, essential care partner relationship, both with the resident and with the team might be unique, right? A daughter coming to visit someone in, uh, you know, a, a parent in long-term care might be an essential care partner, but their role might be different from a spouse who might also come. Um, and so it, I think that both are valid, um, but but each might have unique uh, tasks or roles that they that they um, that they're involved in. Thank you. So as I mentioned, this session's kind of coming to a close. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, what you can do after the session ends, is you can go back to the lobby and you can chat, use the chat feature to ask any questions you might have with each other about um, family councils, about projects you have on the go or anything else that's come up as you uh, have participated in today's sessions. Allison, I'm seeing the gratitude from participants to your presentation with clap. and hearts and love. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share a little bit about your program and thumbs up and celebrations. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And we'll see you for our final session, uh, which is focused on um, our DIRAC committee. Uh, so an equity, diversity and inclusion and what it means. So thank you so much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you for our final session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Allison.